Odyssey, Book 17. When dawn brushed the early sky with rose, Odysseus' son bound on his beautiful sandals and hefted his spear. He was in a hurry to get to the city, and he said to his swineherd, I'm off to the town, Eumaeus. My mother won't stop crying until she sees me again in person. But this is what I want you to do. Take this down and out stranger into the city so that he can beg for food. Whoever wants to can give him some bread and a cup of water. There's no way I can worry about everyone. I have too much on my mind. If the stranger gets upset about this, it's just too bad. I'm the sort of person who likes to talk straight. And Odysseus, his mind teeming, said, Friend, don't think I'm eager myself to be left behind here. For a beggar like me, it's better to beg for food in the town than out in the fields. And whoever wants to can give me something. I'm past the age where I can stay on a farm and have to do everything some foreman tells me. You go on. This man here will lead me to town as soon as I have warmed myself by the fire, and the sun is higher. These clothes I'm wearing are not so good, and the morning frost might do me in. You say the city is pretty far. Thus Odysseus and Telemachus strode quickly out of the farmstead, sowing death for the suitors with every step he took. When he came to the house, he leaned his spear against a tall pillar and went in over the stone threshold. Eurycleia spotted him first, as she was spreading fleeces over finely wrought chairs. She burst into tears and ran straight over to him. The other maids of Odysseus's household gathered round and kissed his head and shoulders in welcome. Then from her bedroom came wise Penelope, looking like Artemis or golden Aphrodite. She burst into tears and threw her arms around him and kissed his head and both his shining eyes, and through her sobs spoke these winged words. You have come, Telemachus, sweet light. I thought I would never see you again after you left in your ship for Pylos, behind my back, for news of your father. But tell me, what did you find out about him? Telemachus answered her coolly, Don't make me weep, mother, or get me all worked up. I barely escaped with my life. Now bathe yourself and put on clean clothes, then go to your bedroom upstairs with your maids, and vow formal sacrifice to the immortal gods in the hope that Zeus will grant us vengeance. I'm going to town so I can invite to our house a stranger who came here with me from Pylos. I sent him on ahead with some of my crew, and I told Piraeus to take him home and show him hospitality until I arrived. Nelpe's response to this died on her lips. She bathed and dressed herself in clean clothes and vowed sacrifice to the immortal gods, praying that Zeus would grant them vengeance some day. Telemachus went out through the hall, holding a spear, two lean hounds at his side. Athena shed a silver grace upon him, and everyone marveled at him as he passed. The haughty suitors crowded around him, fine words on their lips, and evil in their hearts. Telemachus slipped away from the throng and went to sit down over to one side, with mentor Antiphus and Halitherses, old friends of his father. They wanted to know everything Telemachus had done, and then Piraeus came up, leading the stranger, Theoclymenus, up through the city to where the men were gathered. Telemachus did not keep his back to him long, but went up to the stranger, who was his guest. It was Piraeus who spoke first, saying, Telemachus, get some women over to my house, so I can send you the gifts Menelaus gave you. And Telemachus, in his clear-headed way, Piraeus, we don't know how things will turn out, should the suitors treacherously kill me at home and divide among them my family's wealth. I would rather that you keep all these gifts and enjoy them, rather than any of that crowd. But if I manage to sow the seeds of their death, I'll be glad to have all of it back from you then. Saying that, Telemachus led the stranger, who had endured much in life, to his house. They went inside and laid their cloaks on chairs, and then went into the polished tubs and bathed. When the maids had bathed them and rubbed them with oil and flung upon them fleecy cloaks and tunics, they came out of the baths and sat down on chairs. A maid poured water from a golden pitcher into a silver basin for them to wash their hands, and then set up a polished table nearby. Another serving woman, grave and dignified, set out bread and generous helpings from the other dishes she had. Penelope sat opposite her son by the doorpost of the hall, leaning back on a chair and spinning fine yarn. The two men reached for the good cheer before them, and when they had their fill of food and drink, Penelope was the first to speak. Telemachus, I think I will go now to my room upstairs and lie down on my bed, which has become for me a sorrowful bed ever wet with my tears, since the day Odysseus left for Troy with the sons of Atreus. You do not have the heart to tell me before the suitors come in, whatever you have heard about your father's return. And Telemachus, in his clear-headed way, rest assured I will tell you now, mother. We went to Pylos, and Nestor the king there took me into his house. 
He welcomed me as a father might welcome his long-lost son, and he put me up with his own glorious sons. But he said he had heard nothing from anyone about whether Odysseus was dead or alive. He sent me in a chariot to visit Menelaus, Atreus's son, and there I saw Helen, for whose sake the Greek and Trojan armies suffered so much by the will of the gods. Then Menelaus asked me why I had come to gleaming Lacedaemon. I told him why, and this is exactly what he told me then. Those dogs, those puny weaklings, wanting to sleep in the bed of a hero. A doe might as well bed her suckling fawns in the lair of a lion, leaving them there in the bush and then going off over the hills looking for grassy fields. When the lion comes back, the fawns die an ugly death. That's the kind of death these men will die when Odysseus comes back. O oh, Father Zeus and Athena and Apollo, bring Odysseus back with the strength he showed in Lesbos once when he wrestled a match with Philomelades and threw him hard, making all of us cheer. That's the Odysseus I want the suitors to meet. They'd get married all right to bitter death. But as to what you ask me about, I will not stray from the point or deceive you. No, I will tell you all that the infallible old man of the sea told me and hide nothing. He said he saw me on an island, miserable. He said he saw him on an island, miserable in the halls of Calypso, who keeps him there against his will. He has no way to get home to his native land. He has no ships left, no crew to row him over the sea's broad back. Those were the words of Menelaus, Atreus' son, the great spearman. When I finished up there, I set out for home, and a fair wind from the gods brought me back quickly to my native land. So he spoke, and his words wrung her heart. Then Theoclymenus made his voice heard. Revered lady, wife of Laertes' son, Odysseus, Menelaus is in the dark about all this, but now hear what I have to say, for I will prophesy unerringly to you and conceal nothing. With Zeus above all gods as my witness, I swear by this table of hospitality and by Odysseus' hearth, to which I have come, that this same Odysseus, mark my words, is at this moment in his own native land, sitting still or on the move, learning of this evil, and he is sowing evil for all the suitors. Such is the bird of omen I saw from the ship, and I cried it out to Telemachus. And Penelope, calm and circumspect, Ah, stranger, may your words come true. Then you would know my kindness and my gifts would make you blessed in all men's eyes. When they spoke to each other in this way, the suitors were entertaining themselves in front of Odysseus's palace again, throwing the javelin and discus on the level terrace, arrogant as ever. When it was time for dinner, and the flocks were coming in from the fields, Medon, who was the suitor's favorite herald, and was always at their feasts, called out, Young men, now that you have enjoyed yourselves on the field, come inside so we can prepare a feast. Dinner at dinner time is not a bad thing at all. It didn't take much to persuade them. Up they rose and filed into the stately house. They laid their cloaks on the chairs, and some of them got busy slaughtering great sheep and plump goats, fattened hogs, too, and a heifer of the herd. While they were making their dinner, Odysseus and the noble swineherd were getting ready to go up from the fields to the city. The swineherd started off by saying, Well, stranger, since you're eager to go to the city today, as my master ordered, although for my part I'd rather have you here to mind the farm, but I do respect him and fear him, and I certainly don't want a tongue lashing from him, which could go hard. Anyway, we'd better get going. It's late in the day, and it'll get colder toward evening. And Odysseus, his mind teeming. No need to tell me that. I understand. Let's go. You lead the way, all the way. But if you have one cut, give me a staff to lean on. You said the trail was slippery. He spoke and threw around his shoulders his ratty pouch full of holes and slung by a twisted cord. Eumaeus gave him a staff that suited him, and the two of them set out. The dogs and the herdsmen stayed behind to guard the farmstead. And so the swineherd led his master to the city, looking like an old, broken-down beggar, leaning on a staff and dressed in miserable rags. They were well along the rugged path and near the city when they came to a spring where the townspeople got their water. This beautiful fountain had been made by Ithacus and Neritus and Polyctor. A grove of poplars encircled it, and the cold water flowed from the rock above, on top of which was built an altar to the nymphs, where all wayfarers made offerings. There Melanthius, son of Dolius, met them, as he was driving his she-goats, the best in the herds, into town for the suitor's dinner. Two herdsmen trailed along behind him, 
When he saw Eumaeus and his companion, he greeted them with language so ugly it made Odysseus's blood boil to hear it. Well, look at this, trash dragging along trash. Birds of a feather as usual. Where are you taking this walking pile of shit, you miserable hog tender? This diseased beggar who will slobber all over our feasts. How many doorposts has he rubbed with his shoulders, begging for scraps? You think he's ever gotten a proper present, a cauldron or sword? Ha! Give him to me and I'll give him... S I'll have him sweep out the pens and carry loads of shoots for the goats to eat. Put some muscle on his thigh by drinking whey. I'll bet he's never done a day's hard day's work in his life. No, he prefers to beg his way through town for food to stuff into his bottomless belly. I'll tell you this, though, and you can count on it. If he comes to the palace of godlike Odysseus, he'll be pelted with footstools aimed at his head. If he's lucky, they'll only splinter on his ribs. And as he passed Odysseus, the fool kicked him on the hip, trying to shove him off the path. Odysseus absorbed the blow without even quivering, only stood there and tried to decide whether to jump the man and knock him dead with his staff, or lift him by the ears and smash his head to the ground. In the end, he controlled himself and just took it. But the swineherd looked the man in the eye and told him off and lifted his hands in prayer. Nymphs of the spring, daughters of Zeus, if Odysseus ever honored you by burning thigh bones of lamb and kid wrapped in rich fat, grant me this prayer. May my master come back. May some god guide him back. Then he would scatter all that puffery of yours, all the airs you put on strutting around town while bad herdsmen destroy all the flocks. Melanthius the goat herd came back with this. Listen to the dog talk with his big bad notions. I'm going to take him off in a black ship some day, far from Ithaca, and sell him for a fortune. You want my prayer? May Apollo with his silver bow strike Telemachus dead today in his halls. Or may the suitors kill him as surely as Odysseus is lost for good in some faraway land. He left them with that. They walked on slowly while the goat herd pushed ahead and came quickly to the palace. He went right in and sat down among the suitors, opposite Eurymachus, whom he liked best of all. The servers set out for him a helping of meat, and the grave housekeepers brought him bread. Odysseus and the swineherd came up to the house and halted. The sound of the hollow lyre drifted out to them, for Phemius was sweeping the strings as he began his song. Odysseus took the swineherd's hand and said, Eumaeus, this beautiful house must be Odysseus's. It would stand out anywhere. Look at all the rooms and stories and the court built with wall and coping and the well-fenced double gates. No one could scorn it. And I can tell there are many men feasting inside from the savor of meat wafting out from it and the sound of the lyre which rounds out a feast. And you answered him, so I heard Eumaeus. You don't miss a thing, do you? Well, let's figure out what we should do here. Either you go in first and mingle with the suitors while I wait here, or you wait here, if you'd rather, and I'll go in before you. But don't wait long, or someone might see you, and either throw something at you or smack you. Think it over. What would you like to do? And Odysseus, the godlike survivor. I understand. You don't have to prompt me. You go in before me, and I'll wait here. I've had things thrown at me before, and I have an enduring heart, Eumaeus. God knows I've had my share of suffering in war and at sea. I can take more if I have to, but no one can hide a hungry belly. It's our worst enemy. It's why we launch ships to bring war to men across the barren sea. And as they talked, a dog that was lying there lifted his head and pricked up his ears. This was Argus, whom Odysseus himself had patiently bred but never got to enjoy, before he left for Ilion. The young men used to set him after wild goats, deer, and hare. Now, his master gone, he lay neglected in the dung of mules and cattle outside the doors, a deep pile where Odysseus's farmhands would go for manure to spread on his fields. There lay the hound Argus, infested with lice, and now, when he set, sensed Odysseus was near, he wagged his tail and dropped both ears, but could not drag himself nearer his master. Odysseus wiped away a tear, turning his head, so Eumaeus wouldn't notice, and asked him, Eumaeus, isn't it strange that this dog is lying in the dung? He's a beautiful animal, but I wonder if he has speed to match his looks, or if he's like the table dogs men keep for show. And you answered him, Eumaeus, my swineherd, Ah, yes, this dog belonged to a man who has died far from home. He was quite an animal once. If he were now as he was when Odysseus left for Troy, you would be amazed at his speed and strength. 
There's nothing in the deep woods that dog couldn't catch, and what a nose he had for tracking. But he's fallen on hard times. Now his master has died abroad. These feckless women don't take care of him. Servants never do right when their masters aren't on top of them. Zeus takes away half a man's worth the day he loses his freedom. So saying, Eumaeus entered the great house, and the hall filled with insolent suitors. But the shadow of death descended upon Argus, once he had seen Odysseus after twenty years. Godlike Telemachus spotted the swineherd first, striding through the hall, and with a nod of his head signaled him to join him. Eumaeus looked around and took a stool that lay near, one that the carver ordinarily sat on when he sliced meat for the suitors dining in the hall. Eumaeus took this stool and placed it at Telemachus's table opposite him and sat down. A herald came and served him a portion of meat and bread from the basket. Soon after, Odysseus came in, looking like an old broken-down beggar, leaning on a staff and dressed in miserable rags. He sat down on the ashwood threshold just inside the doors, leaning back on the cypress doorpost, a post plain and true by some skillful carpenter in days gone by. Telemachus called the swineherd over, and taking a whole loaf from the beautiful basket and all the meat his hands could hold, said to him, Take this over to the stranger and tell him to go around and beg from each of the suitors. Shame is no good companion for a man in need. Thus Telemachus, the swineherd, nodded. And going over to Odysseus, said to him, Telemachus gives you this, and he tells you to go around and beg from each of the suitors. Shame, he says, is not good for a beggar. And Odysseus, his mind teeming. Lord Zeus, may Telemachus be blessed among men, and may he have all that his heart desires. And he took the food in both his hands, and set it down at his feet on his beggar's pouch. Odysseus ate as long as the bard sang in the hall. The came to an end, and the suitors began to be noisy and boisterous. Athena drew near to him and prompted him to go among the suitors and beg for crusts, and so learn which of them were decent men, and which were scoundrels. Not that the goddess had the slightest intention of sparing any of them. Odysseus made his rounds from right to left, stretching his hands out to every side, as if he had been a beggar all his life. They all pitied him and gave him something, and they wondered out loud who he was and where he had come from. To which questions Melanthius the goat herd volunteered, Hear me, suitors of our noble queen. As to this stranger, I might have seen him before. I have seen him before. The swineherd brought him here, but who he is I have no idea, or where he claims he was born. At this, Antinous tore into the swineherd. Swineherd, why did you bring this man to town? Don't we have enough tramps around here without him, this nuisance of a beggar, who will foul our feast? I suppose you don't care that these men are eating away your master's wealth, or you wouldn't have invited him. The swineherd Eumaeus came back with this. You may be a fine gentleman, Antinous, but that's an ugly thing to say. Who indeed ever goes out of his way to invite a stranger from abroad, unless it's a prophet, or a healer, or a builder, or a singer of tales, someone like that, a master of his craft who benefits everyone? Men like that get invited everywhere on earth, but who would burden himself with a beggar? You're just plain mean, the meanest of the suitors, to Odysseus's servants, and especially to me. But I don't care, as long as my lady Penelope lives in the hall and godlike Telemachus. To which Telemachus responded coolly, Quiet, don't waste your words on this man. Antinous is nasty like that, provoking people with harsh words and egging them on. And then he had these fletched words for Antinous. Why, Antinous, you're just like a father to me, kindly advising me to kick this stranger out. God forbid that should ever happen. No, go ahead and give him something. I want you to. Don't worry about my mother or anyone else in this house when it comes to giving things away. But the truth, it, truth is that you're just being selfish and would rather eat more yourself than give any away. And Antinous answered him, What a high and mighty speech, Telemachus. Look now, if only everyone gave him what I will, it would be months before he darkened your door. As he spoke, he grabbed the stool upon which he propped his shining feet whenever he dined, and brandished it beneath the table. But all the rest gave the beggar something, and filled his pouch with bread and meat. And Odysseus would have had his taste of the suitors free of charge, but on his way back to the threshold he stopped by Antinous's place and said, Give me something, friend. You don't look like you are the poorest man here, far from it, but the most well-off. You look like a king, so you should give me more than the others. If you did, I'd sing your praises all over the earth. I, too, once had a house of my own, a rich man and a wealthy house. 
and I gave freely and often to any and every one who wandered by. I had slaves, too, more than I could count, and everything I needed to live the good life. But Zeus smashed it all to pieces one day. Who knows why? When he sent me out with rowing pirates all the way to Egypt so I could meet my doom. I moored my ships in the River Nile, and you can be sure I ordered my trusty mates to stand by and guard them while I sent out scouts to look around. Then the crews got cocky and overconfident and started pillaging the Egyptian countryside, carrying off the women and children and killing the men. The cry came to the city, and at daybreak, troops answered the call. The whole plain was filled with infantry, war chariots, and the glint of bronze. Thundering Zeus threw my men into a panic, and not one had the courage to stand and fight against odds like that. It was bad. They killed many of us outright with bronze and led the rest to their city to work as slaves. But they gave me to a friend of theirs from Cyprus to take me back there and give me to Demeter, son of Iasus, who ruled Cyprus with an iron hand. From there I came with all my hard luck. Antinous had this to say in reply, What god has brought this plague in here? Get off to the side, away from me, or I'll show you Egypt and Cyprus, you pushy panhandler. You don't know your place. You make your rounds and everyone hands things out recklessly. And why shouldn't they? It's easy to be generous with someone else's wealth. Odysseus took a step back and answered him. It's too bad your mind doesn't match your good looks. You wouldn't have a suppliant even give a suppliant even a pinch of salt if you had to give it from your own cupboard. Here you sit at another man's table and you can't bear to give me a piece of bread from the huge pile that's right by your hand. This made Antinous even angrier, and he shot back with a dark scowl. That does it. I'm not going to let you just breeze out of here if you're going to insult me. As he spoke, he grabbed the footstool and threw it, hitting Odysseus under his right shoulder blade. Odysseus stood there as solid as a rock and didn't even blink. He only shook his head in silence and <laughs> darkly. Then he went back to the threshold and sat down with his pouch bulging and spoke to the suitors. Hear me, suitors of our glorious queen, so I can speak my mind. No one regrets being hit while fighting for his own possessions, his cattle or sheep. But Antinous struck me because of my belly, the vile, growing, growling beast that gives us so much trouble. If there are gods for beggars or avenging spirits, may death come to Antinous before marriage does. Antinous, son of Eupethes, answered, just sit still and eat, stranger, or get the hell out. Keep talking like this, and some of the young men here will haul you by the feet all through the house and strip the skin right off your back. Thus Antinous. But the other suitors turned on him, one of them saying, That was foul, Antinous, hitting a poor beggar. You're done for if he turns out to be a god, come down from heaven the way they do, disguised as strangers from abroad or whatever, going around to different cities and seeing who's lawless and who lives by the rules. Antinous paid no attention to this. Telemachus took it hard that his father was struck, but he kept it inside. Not a tear fell from his eye. He only shook his head in silence and brooded darkly. When Penelope, sitting with her maids, heard the stranger had been struck, she said, So may you be struck by the archer god. And Euronomi, the housekeeper, said to her, if our prayers were answered, not one of these men would live to see Dawn take her seat in the sky. Penelope answered in her circumspect way, They are all hateful, nurse, for their evil designs. But Antinous is like black death itself. Some poor stranger makes his round through the house, begging alms from the men because he is in need, and all the others fill his pouch with gifts, but Antinous throws a footstool at him and hits him in the back beneath his shoulder. Thus Penelope, sitting with her women, while noble Odysseus ate his dinner. Then she called the swineherd to her and said, Noble Eumaeus, tell the stranger to come here so that I can greet him and ask him if perhaps he has heard anything about Odysseus or seen him with his own eyes. By his looks he is a man who has wandered the world. And you, my swineherd, answered her, I wish the men would keep quiet, lady, for his speech would charm your very soul. Three nights I had him with me and three days I kept him in my hut, for it was to me he first came when he jumped ship but he still did not finish the long story of all his hard times. It was just as when men gaze at a bard who sings to them songs learned from the gods, bittersweet songs, and they could listen forever. That's how he charmed me when he sat in my house. He says he's an ancestral friend of Odysseus, and that he comes from Crete, the land of Minos. It was from Crete he came here on a hard journey. It gets even harder as he wanders on, like a rolling stone. 
He insists he has news that Odysseus is near over in Thesprotia, alive and well, and bringing many treasures home. And Penelope, calm and circumspect, go call him here so he can tell me face to face. As for these men, let them play their games outside or here in the house. They're in a good mood as well they might be, their own possessions lying safe at home their bread and sweet wine feeding only their servants, while they themselves mob our house day after day, slaughtering all our oxen, our sheep, and fat goats, partying and recklessly drinking our wine, ruining everything. For there is no man here like Odysseus to protect this house. But if Odysseus should ever come home, he and his son would make them pay for this outrage. Just as she finished, Telemachus sneezed, a loud sneeze that rang through the halls. Penelope laughed and said to Eumaeus, Go ahead and call the stranger for me. Didn't you see my son sneeze at my words? That means death will surely come to the suitors one and all. Not a single man will escape. And one more thing. What do you think of this? If I find that he speaks everything truthfully, I'll clothe him in a handsome tunic and cloak. The swineherd took this all in. He went over to Odysseus, and his words flew fast. Penelope, Telemachus's mother, wants to see you. Her heart urges her, for all her pain, to ask you about her husband. If she finds that you speak everything truly, she will give you a handsome tunic and cloak, which you really do need. As for your belly, you'll still have to fill it by public begging. And Odysseus, who had borne much, Eumaeus, I will soon be telling the whole truth to Penelope, Icarius' wise daughter. For I know Odysseus very well, and he and I have been through much the same grief. But I am leery of this mob of rough suitors whose arrogance grates on the sky's iron dome, just now, as I was making my way through the hall, not doing any harm to anyone, this man struck me hard, and neither Telemachus nor anyone else did anything to stop him. So please ask Penelope for all her eagerness to wait in the hall until the sun goes down. Then she can ask me about her husband's return, and she can seat me nearer the fire. These clothes I have on are not very good, as you should know, for it was to you first I came as a suppliant. When he heard this, the swineherd went off, and when he crossed the threshold, Penelope said, you're not bringing him with you, Eumaeus. What does he mean by this? Does he fear someone more than he should? Or is there something else here that makes him hang back? A shy beggar's a poor one. And you answered her, Eumaeus, my swineherd. What he says is right, as everyone would agree, about avoiding the violence of arrogant men. He asks you to wait until the sun goes down, and it would be far seemlier for you too, lady, if you and the stranger had your talk in private. Penelope answered, in her circumspect way. Our guest is no fool. He sees what could happen. These men are bent on senseless violence more than any mortal men I can imagine. Thus Penelope and the godlike swineherd, having said his peace to her with the throng of suitors, he found Telemachus, and with his head close to him so no one could hear, he spoke to him these feathered words. I'm going off now, dear Telemachus, to guard the wine and all, your livelihood and mine. You take courage of everything here. You take charge of everything here. Take care of yourself, first and foremost, and be on the lookout so you don't get hurt. Many of these men are up to no good. May Zeus destroy them utterly before any harm can come to us. And Telemachus, in his cool-headed way, Amen to that. Go after supper, but at dawn come back with your best boars for sacrifice. Everything here is up to me and the gods. So the swineherd sat down again on a polished chair, when he had eaten and drunk to his heart's content, he went off to his swine, leaving the courts and hall full of banqueters. They were singing and dancing and having a good time, for it was evening now.